the other people you saw were the officers who came and talked to you politely. But the, the real people running the Zeppelin, the rest of the passengers didn't see them. Every morning there were freshly baked rolls. Lunch, five o'clock tea, with freshly baked cakes, of course. The cooks, in my opinion, were, I believe, the busiest of the crew. Sometimes they were poorly appreciated, I think. You always get some passengers who complain all the time. And they would come one after the other to breakfast, and many liked to stay sitting there, occasionally standing up going to the window and looking out. There was always something to see from the ship, even over the sea, because we flew so low. Normally, we were between only 250 to 500 meters. There was certainly no boredom. Some passengers would write reports on typewriters. Others read a book. What we offered on board was very similar in many ways to that which was offered on board an ocean liner. I have a certificate presented to me by Aeolus, rather than Neptune, proving that I had crossed the equator in a Zeppelin. There was a tall officer coming along and he kicked his heels and said, you are the first Englishwoman to cross the South Atlantic in a Graf Zeppelin, and I congratulate you, and would you care to see round the Zeppelin? <laughs> would I care? There was a catwalk which went from nose to tail and looming over everything, the gas. It was squishy when you touched it. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and there was a doorway. Well, there was a man sitting there, apparently two hours at a time. They sat there watching the engine. And there was no handrail, there was no nothing. There was just you and the Atlantic. As the engine gondola was a few meters out from the main hull of the airship, there was a connecting ladder. When we wanted to go down into it, a sort of door or flap could be opened, and you climbed down the ladder. The first time it took a bit of courage, but we got used to it. When we saw a whale being attacked, by sharks, and we were low enough to see the blood. I mean, that was wildly exciting. You felt you could lean out and touch the mountains. It was absolutely superb. This was just gliding like a sort of, I don't know, a dream more than anything else. In Britain, Two giant sheds at Cardington in Bedfordshire still mark the site of the Imperial Airship Scheme. Sixty years ago, the British government saw airships as a means of linking the empire by air. Two were ordered, the R100 and the R101. The R101 was comparable in size to the Graf Zeppelin but Britain lacked the expertise in building and operating airships which had been learned in Germany. It was overweight, it leaked, and it was pressed into service before being properly tested. So we came out of the hangar at five o'clock, about five o'clock in the morning. It was 
quite dark, dark, in the semi-darkness. The ship was walked out of the shed and then was transferred to the mooring mast, which was for the mile across the aerodrome. Everybody naturally thought that this was the beginning of a new era for long distance passenger flights, deluxe travel, but in much quicker time than a normal ship at sea would do it. Lord Thompson of Cardington, the Secretary of State for Air, was impatient to fly to India. There were protests that more trials were needed, but Lord Thompson insisted that he leave on schedule. There were 54 passengers and crew on board. As far as the crew were concerned, nobody was unhappy about leaving. Nobody was worried about it. R101 was loaded with provisions for the flight, including champagne, and by one estimate, a ton of luggage for Lord Thompson. In the early evening, he climbed aboard for what was the airship's first flight of any distance. Quite a crowd had gathered to see her depart. My father and I had been out on the day when the R101 left on this fateful trip to India. And we got to Cardington when she had just left the mooring mast. And so we saw her go. I said, wouldn't it be lovely to be in our... And I always remember my father said, no, I'd rather stay with my feet firmly on the ground. I think he had heard quite a lot of rumors and worries that perhaps she had not done enough trials. She went very slowly, and she certainly didn't seem to gain very great height before she actually disappeared from our sight. All of a sudden, the ship struck and blew up immediately in one complete flash. And looking at into the blackness, all you could see was a huge flame and the noise, a terrific explosion. So. In the night, the R101 had crashed into high ground near Beauvais in France. Forty-eight of the 54 people on board, including Lord Thompson, died in the fire. The six survivors were flown back to Britain to tell of their experience. I suddenly looked back and there were sparks following behind me. I suddenly realized my hands were hurting, the backs of my hands were hurting, so I ran along my hands in the air. I head down and I ran straight into the side of a cow. Two chaps in white smocks came running towards me and when they saw me they crossed themselves. They then took me to the hospital. So I finally found that I had both hands burnt on the back and my face was burnt. While I was in hospital in Moulay I was blind for about three days. In the next bed to me, it was a rigger who was on patrol in the keel of the ship. He died the next morning. It was British Aviation's Titanic. People might have heard of ships sinking and large numbers of people being drowned, but I don't think there'd ever been so many people fall out of the sky one day before and be killed. The dead were buried together at Cardington. And I shall never forget seeing that long, long procession come. 48 coffins. And there were car loads and lorry loads of wreaths and flowers. And slowly they came, and slowly the coffins were unladen, and they were carried through the gates into one large grave, which was dug just inside the gate where they were all placed.
lies. Because they didn't know whose coffin was whose, I don't think. Because I think they were terribly burnt, weren't they? The cause of the disaster was never determined. Britain's other airship, the R-100, was broken up. The Imperial airship scheme was abandoned. Others were not deterred. The loss of the R-101 has not shaken one iota. My confidence in the practicability of rigid airships and their great value as a means of international communication and transportation over the ocean. In America, Admiral William Moffat headed the Navy's airship program. Once again, great national pride was at stake. A quarter of a million people watched the First Lady, Mrs. Herbert Hoover, launch the Akron in August 1931. But behind the celebrations, Moffat's dedication to airships was controversial. He had to fight the battleship admirals for money. He had to go to Congress and convince uh, Congress that we had to have money for airships, which he did very vigorously. And he got money for airships. I think the contract price was about three and a half million dollars. You couldn't build one of those ships a day for two or three hundred million. Moffat saw airships performing the same role they had in the war, long-range maritime patrols. To increase their effectiveness, they carried aircraft. They had a trapeze, and then the airplane had a hook on it. The trapeze would lower them down about 20 feet below the belly of the airship, and then they'd, his engine would be going, and he'd trip his latch, and he would be free from the trapeze, and he would take off, and he was flying. He was an airplane. You had four planes on some of those ships. The planes would go out in all directions, far beyond the airship, and report back, of course, what they saw. We had a hangar inside of the ship. And then the pilot would maneuver his plane up and hook onto this thing, and then he'd be hoisted back up into the hangar in the airship. The Navy found that their airships had other uses. Remember one time President Roosevelt made a trip from Washington through the Panama Canal to Honolulu, and so we were ordered to deliver newspapers to him. Imagine that. So we took a bunch of San Francisco newspapers and went way down there to hell and gone between Honolulu and Panama and dropped these newspapers on the deck of his cruiser. We were going to moor out at Camp Kearney, which is right outside of San Diego. The first big airship ever was out here. And we got a lot of sailors from North Island to come out and act as a ground crew. They'd never seen an airship before. They had to be trained on very short notice, and their training, of course, was very primitive. Well, all of a sudden, the main wire holding the airship down parted. The men were pulling down on the guy lines, and suddenly there was a gust of wind, which turned the nose of the ship up, and suddenly it went up into the air. I yelled with a microphone to all these people. I said, let go, let go, let go. But a few of them just hung on for dear life because they'd been told to. We were carried 200 feet into the air. You and Edmund and Henson could hold on no longer. Their grips loosened, and... Two of them dropped off. One of them dropped very close to where we were. And the one we could see dangling from the airship from a great height. And later we learned that he had held onto the rope with one hand and tied the rope around his waist with the other, and he was saved. The thing that I think that impressed me the most was the fact that he was able to hold on with one hand and tie that rope around his waist with the other hand. I remember going out to a pepper tree out in our backyard where we had a rope hanging and trying to do the same thing and realized that uh, no young boy could do, have the strength to do that. It impressed me very much. Why didn't you jump uh, when you saw you were being taken aloft? Well, I felt it, in it put their lives below me in danger. Uh, what was your sensation when you were hauled into the Akron? It was a grand, glorious feeling to get inside once more. <laughs> America's Akron and her sister ship, the Macon, were both lost in crashes at sea. 